Hi, uh, this is Glenn Matlock, shooting the breeze and hanging out with Rob on Front Row Live. Check it out, folks. What's up, guys? Rob here from Live Entertainment, and I'm hanging out here with Glenn Matlock, and I'm, I'm super excited to be talking to you. Yeah, well, nice to <laughs> be chatting to you on a Sunday. What day is it today? Sunday, yeah? It's Sunday, but I'm, I'm, lately I have I'm, not been able to... <laughs> I've been here, there, and everywhere, and um, I was in the desert yesterday. We've, we've yeah. played Coachella with Blondie and came back. So, yeah, and then I did a little gig with my mate Slim Jim Phantom yeah. last night at the Roxy. His, his a wedding vow renewal... <laughs> concert yeah it's fun it's kind of cool there's stuff going on you know that's awesome what, what was that uh what was your experience this time with coachella uh and blondie uh you did last week as well right yeah it was well last week we did it with uh, noel rogers got up with us which was kind of interesting but not everybody knew how the song should finish properly and it kind of went off into this <laughs> sort of slightly funky jazz rock exploration but it was cool for that and then this week, we actually had a bigger crowd. There was, we played inside, but it's like a big barn kind of thing, sort of. Yeah. And there was all people outside, couldn't get in under the cover. It was cool. It was good. I've really enjoyed playing with Blondie. It's yeah. great musicians. They've got a great body of work. Debbie's in great shape, sings great. I mean, sometimes we do a nearly two-hour show, you know, and she's not, the, she's not 16, you know, and she, yeah. and she does it. It's, it's, it's cool. But the band... A band gels pretty well, you know. It's normally a good measure of a band is when you go wrong, you collectively pull it back together, you know. Just we can do that. That's kind of cool. And I've also played with Clem with loads of different projects. I've known Clem for since Blondie turned up in London, like seventy seven or something like that, and we've been friends since then. So there's um you know, we got some kind of symbiosis going on somehow yeah. as a rhythm section. I feel I, I just I feel like if I hear your name I hear Clem if I hear Clem I hear your name like it, it's. Well, do you know what Clem's wife, Ellen? If I'm going to go and stay with him, it's going to be she keeps getting mixed up. Like, Clem, 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 Clem. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> so with your experiences with being able to uh, be also a musician for many other major artists and and being able to play festivals and playing like small gigs like like last night. How does that help you become a better artist now that, you know, you've obviously been in the industry for so long. I don't know if it's helped but you become any better at all. <laughs> so, no, but you do things and you, you don't realise, but you're picking something up and by yeah. osmosis, little things sink in and fortunate enough to be travelling around everywhere. I mean, as well as doing Coachella, we went to Colombia and played in a couple of shows in Bogota and then we was in Mexico City. You see things that they don't necessarily strike a chord, but maybe in six months' time you pick up a guitar and you're stuck for a line in a song you're trying to write and something just comes back. And if you just sit at home in your room trying to write songs, you've got no material, you know. You, you've got So it all adds up somehow. And it might seem to some people I do loads of different things, but I only do two things. I play rock and roll. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of purloin in the. I play play all kinds of music, country and western. <laughs> I love that, and and right now we're getting ready uh, for the release of of the solo album, yeah. and um, you know, so far you've released four or five tracks off it, and I'm curious, like coming into this, I know it it took quite some time to basically like write and record this record, so coming. Oh, it, it was longer because I. I did the bulk of the loud bits, it's the kind of technical term, you know, the drums and yeah. just before lockdown and then lockdown happened and it put everything on ice, but it helped me kind of revisit some of the material. Yeah, and you record the music, but then you've got all the vocals to do and at home I've got a little studio and you, you haven't got a clock that's kind of ticking away, so you can kind of really hone yeah. what you trying to talk about really you know and some of the stuff on the album in the UK you know we've had this Brexit thing and a ridiculous lurch to right-wing politics which is not only in the UK but yeah. you know it's not on and but that's personally affecting you so. it's personally affecting me as a touring musician both my sons are in are musicians and all my friends and lots of people a lot in the music industry have lost yeah. 
a lot of work because they don't have immediate access to Europe. I mean, we had we could travel and work freely in 27 countries, and now we can't. Yeah, it's like how is that a forward step? You know, it's not. A lot it, of backwards movements. Yeah, I, you know, and even people like um, Elton John, you know, saying it's wrong. You know, there's a whole panoply of people doing really well and people are sort of doing all right and some people are struggling they're all in agreement about it yeah and they, and some of their fans who music lovers voted for it it's like thanks it's tough it's tough i mean there's always that 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 wrong side of the spectrum but it's like sometimes it's like it's surprising that it's some of your closest friends that will still be against what you're believing in or what's going on around the world yeah, but some of the closest friends aren't closest friends anymore <laughs> You know. That was a good life lesson. Well, I had, I had a builder who lives down the road who was going to do some work for me. He was going to paint the outside of my house. I've got like a duplex in London and we have to share the painting of it. And I got a quote from this guy. And then we ended up talking politics. And then I found out he voted for Brexit. And I said, well, what happens when you go abroad? Yeah. Oh, I've never been abroad. I thought, oh. I thought you'd toss her. <laughs> Anyway, when he said, so you still want me to do this thing? I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the, um, uh, it was an Afghani guy who does work around my way. I said, I'm going to get him. He said, why? It was his cheap quote. I said, no, but he didn't vote for Brexit. <laughs> Tough. Those, it's very polarizing, yeah, you know. It really is, and it, it, it's more polarizing when it's someone that doesn't understand what it really means, and they're just like, you know, it sounds right. I'm going to vote for it. Yeah, and, and um yeah, it's polarising, but I think sometimes if you is it just as polarised with certain kinds of people, you get a tiny bit of small amount of satisfaction and getting a bit yeah. of claw back. But you know, and the whole Trump thing. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm not an expert on American politics. Although the more I'm here, I find out more about it. But I saw a great little thing. Some girl was talking in her car about Trump and how Trump. The, the best thing about him is that no how matter how low you are on the social stratus, he makes you feel you're better than somebody below you. <laughs> you know, and that's that's kind of the be all and end all of it. That's not right. Yeah, it's funny, but it's not funny really. It's <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> as as you were working on this body of work, uh that's more of a political stance for you, like do you it's not out and out political, but you know, I think it's an abrogation of responsibility mm. to not reflect what's going on about you. And it's not yeah. po-faced, you know, it's quite tongue-in-cheek, some, yeah, yeah. some of the songs. Um, and they're not all like that. But, yeah, I think you've got to reflect what's going on about you. But when the first single come out, which is very, um, what's the word, it's sort of, I don't know, alluding to it. It's actually called Head on a Stick, so it, it's, it's quite blatant. But I did all the big breakfast shows and in England and it caused quite a stir. One of the things I did for the BBC went viral. And <laughs> but it was mainly because I thought I was on at eight and I didn't go on at quarter past nine in the morning. And I, had, I was annoyed. <laughs> 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 what was your writing process this time around? Like, did you feel like you were like in the moment um, as kind of situations were happening, as, as experiences were happening for you? Or is this something that it's just a mixture of experiences that you've been hearing, feeling, going through and then you finally felt like it was the right time to start writing about it. It's, it's kind of a little bit of both really but leading up to Brexit you know there was a whole gestation period of it and you could see certain thing co things coming and I, I'm actually quite a big fan of um, Pete Seeger mm -hmm. and Trini Lopez had a hit with one of his songs If I Had a Hammer and he's hammering out a warning some of the songs I started writing back then I could see things coming and I'm not a brainiac, but um, I'm not stupid either, you know. And it was a bit frustrating that because I couldn't get the record out then, then it's taken a while for the music industry, especially for somebody like me, you know, everybody wants to know you for what you did in the past. And then to be taken more seriously as a contemporary artist at my age, so somebody's not really rushing to give me a million dollars to get the record out. Write a song now and we'll put it out on, on Friday and I'll, we'll put it out on Monday. It's not like that. It takes a while. And I thought I'd lost my moment, but I was in New York. We had a break from doing the Blondie stuff and me and Clem got to do a session with um, 
Ivan Julian and Richard Lloyd for some TV show they're making about this guy who was brought up on a Bowery. Anyway, we went there and I got asked to do some press stuff for Sirius on the Monday. This is like two weeks ago. So I'm going to promote my album Consequences Coming, but I couldn't get a cab to go up Sixth Avenue in the morning because there was a whole conniption going on uptown. And what it was, it was Trump going downtown to the court, down Fifth Avenue to be arraigned, you know. Yeah. So maybe I didn't miss the moment, you know. <laughs> you were right, you were, I guess you were in the right place at the right time. Yeah, <laughs> it seems, seems like it. We'll see, you know. How do you, how do you get in that headspace though where you feel like you've missed your moment and then you kind of get that energy again? Like, I feel like for us today, like when, when we feel like we don't belong or we have that imposter syndrome, it's hard to let go of that and focus on any, any positivity. But like, how are you able to kind of get out of that and, and focus on the positive? How do I get out of it? I just kind of do it anyway. I mean, I'm either really clever, really stupid or just thick skinned. And that's what I do. You know, I'm a songwriter. If you, if you're a fisherman and you don't go fishing or if you're a ballet dancer and you don't ballet dance, you're full of shit, right? And so I kind of push myself to do these things. And also, I think being a songwriter, being an artist of some kind of description is quite therapeutic. I'd like to know what the ratio of musicians who kind of have a way to talk about what's on their mind, how many of them end up on the shrink's couch? Yeah. Maybe it's less because you've got an outlet, yeah. you know? Or there is a few wacky people around you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like when it comes to songwriting, like there's been moments, maybe on this album, um, where there were certain either lyrics or topics that you wanted to talk about that you didn't feel you could put to paper and let alone release to the world? Um, not really, no, I'm not that dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, when we was recording it, um, it's a solo album, but there's a band involved, and the band is a, like, a loose conglomeration of friends who are available, good mates, and got an English guy called Chris Musto, who's played with Johnny Thunders, and Nico's played with Neil X, who's played with Zizig Sputnik, and then I was touring with El Slick. He's quite instrumental on a, a lot of the album, and there's a Japanese guy called... Hot Eye, who's, um, do you know him? Incredible. Yes, I do. Yeah, he played on the track, which we kind of co-wrote. And then, actually, when nobody could meet up, I, I wrote a couple of songs, which en have ended up, it was the first one, Head on a Stick, and the last one on the album called This Ship, which is kind of ship, S-H-I-P, <laughs> um, which is kind of questioning people's patriotism. You know, when there's, like, real right-wing people saying, oh, if you're not with us, you're against us, and we're patriotic and you're not. Well, f*** you, no. But it, it, it's undermining your patriotism, so the song's about that. But those two songs, I actually, they top and tail the album, and, and I'd written them in after um, I'd recorded the bulk of it. So, and a few people had been doing, like, charity things, you know, support the nurses. Around the world, there's something I did with Clam, he played drums on it, and Slick put some guitar on something, and some of the guys from um, uh, Spandau Ballet sung on it, and nobody met up. They did it all on their little computer studios yeah. at home. And then I did another thing. There's a friend of mine called Henry Padovani, who's Corsican, and he was the original guitarist in The Police. He's a good... Nice. And he called me up, he said, these guys have um, sent me a track, it's really good, but it needs bass. Well, you send, if I send it to you, you will... We put some bass on it. I said, yeah, I'll have a go. And I heard the track, and it's, like, really good. So I just did it, because I liked it, sent him back to it. He sent it back to them, who were in Buenos Aires, and then they spoke to their manager, who sent me some money for doing it, who was in Switzerland, right? Yeah. None of us ever met, and it sounds good. And so that there was a possibility of doing things like that. So with these extra couple of songs, I think your life was a bit lighter at one stage than it was in England. I couldn't go in the studio. I was talking to Clem, I said, can you put some drums on this if I send you a guitar part? And he did. So he's on a couple of tracks, and then he sent me the files back, and then I could go into a studio a little bit later on yeah. and and um, do a bit more. So, you know, you find a way of working. Yeah. That's kind of cool. The only thing with that is you don't get to take the mickey out of each other so much. <laughs> you know, you have a laugh in the studio, but sometimes through having a laugh, 
or when the song goes off in a different direction, it's kind of, it can be creative, not always. Yeah. Sometimes it's just an excuse to drink more beer. <laughs> Take another shot. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to producing, um, because this is also self-produced as well, right? Um, how do you yeah, step away it, from it? It was also mixed mm. by a guy, I, my last album, Good To Go, which I did about five or six years ago. Yeah. Um, it was mixed by a guy called Mario McNulty and I had met him, I did some work with him that Earl Slicker suggested and he'd met him through working with doing David Bowie's last album. So you send him a bunch of stuff and then there's like spurious things and he'll get rid of that and then make more of... So although it's self-produced, it's also kind of been overseen quite well, I think. You know, yeah. I think it's quite a good sounding record room. Would you say that there's a song uh, on this album that you felt like the most challenged with? Um, and not necessarily because the whole situation, but just like either putting vocals on it or putting instrumentation to it. Well, I think one every time I do an album, I like to try and do a cover of something that people really wouldn't associate with me. And then the last album, I did a cover of a Scott Walker song called Montague Terrace and Blue, which is a big ballad yeah. epic. But I thought that's no reason to not do it. And, you know, he's got like a 76 piece string orchestra on it. But I've got El Slick with his Ebo on it, you know. But nobody would expect me to do a Scott Walker song. And it came off quite well. And it's even features on that album Slim Jim Phantom playing Tim Parney, you know, right? So that's kind of cool. On this album, I had a go at, and I think it's come out pretty well, um, Constant Craven by KD Lang, okay. which is kind of cool. But if you do a song, there's no point copying it. You might as well do a version of it. I when mean, I was in the studio, in fact, the guy who plays bass on that album, I play on my, the new album, or most of it, is Norman Watroy from the Blockheads. Mm -hmm. And when they were doing it, it was a bit straight. And I said to Chris, who was drumming on it, I said, kind of lay into it a bit more. And he said, like what? I said, well, like the Stones doing Harlem Shuffle. And then kind of Norman picks up on that. And then Al did some guitar on it, and it's kind of a cross between the Stones doing arm shuffle loosely, <laughs> Al sort of playing ashes to ashes kind of guitar picking, then me having a go at KD Lang song, which I didn't realise it is a big sort of lesbian gay anthem, but it's a song of like kind of hope and yearning for something a bit yeah. better. So I'm not doing it to take the Mickey out. I do it because I genuinely like it, you know. And there's loads of stuff out there from. Years ago, and people I do interviews. Oh, have you heard the latest thing by so and so? Well, not necessarily, no. But have you heard um, the sensational Alex Harvey band? Who's that? Well, they was around in like 1973, 74. Do you know anything about Humble Pie? You know, who are they? Well, you know, there's loads of undiscovered music yeah. and you can pick from it. And I think maybe that's the beauty of the internet and YouTube and stuff like that now. It's, it's a massive digital library of different things yeah do you find yourself look like maybe not necessarily for this project but like just when you're in that like writing mode do you find yourself kind of either gravitating to other music to kind of just no, no, get inspired I, or you I, try I, to I, close I, that out i deliberately don't because if you're listening to something yeah. what you do ends yeah, up yeah. sounding yeah. what that like you know it, it's it's a sort of rabbit hole you can go down that you're sort of plagiarizing things so hopefully you know what i come up with i can't be sued for <laughs> <laughs> which is the bot bottom line i don't mind doing things that are in that kind of idiom yeah but if it sounds too apparently like something else i'll change yeah, it you know be careful. yeah so how do, you, how do you keep yourself fresh uh with every music that you create just because you've had this experience in the music industry so how do you, you know, when it comes to the bass or when it comes to the guitar, or even songwriting, like how are you able to keep it fresh every single time? Like how do you challenge yourself? Um, well, I don't know if it's that fresh. I mean, every time I make an album, one of the alternative jokey titles is SOS. You, now you got to ask me what SOS stands for. What does SOS stand for? Same old shit. <laughs> right. But um, I don't know, I just do what I do, you know, and I, I find sometimes you're in vogue and the wheel moves on a bit and you're not, yeah. and then you're not, and then you're not, and then you're not, and then the wheel keeps coming. Do you know, it's, it's quite a good analogy. When my kid was younger, I took him 
and there's this thing in London called the London Eye, and it's a big wheel, and they've got these little capsules that go round on the south bank, and you can see right over London. Mm. But it's quite high. And when you, take, when you get on it, you know, it's round, the, the thing's going like that, and you, you feel you're really moving. Then yeah. you feel you stopped. And you think, why have you stopped? And you look down. Scary. Well, you're only halfway up, so <laughs> you're going up, up again. And, like, some people's careers are a bit like that. It's yeah. like, you know, they're moving, and then they come to the... And then you're off again. And when you come down the other side, it looks like you're going quite fast, but that's when you're happening. So I feel I'm in that bit at the moment. You know, <laughs> things come up and people ask you to do things, and I was really pleased that Clem had asked me to do the Blondie thing. Yeah. And as well as doing the Blondie thing, it's opened up other doors and it's enabled me to be here. And if I weren't doing that, Slim Jim wouldn't have asked me up last night, you know, and then you meet people. And, I mean, I was hanging out with Chris Montez, you know. <laughs> you know Chris Montez? You've got, you've got so many, like, insane people around you every single time. Yeah, but they're all kind of cool, you know. <laughs> They've all got something going for them. And, yeah, it just makes life interesting, really. Yeah. But I like to say yes, yeah, within reason. Yeah. You can, sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, but you get sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, you know, the right thing. Or you think, well, yeah, I'll give it a go and see what comes of it and it leads to other things yeah i'm excited because this this album drops end of the week um consequence coming is I'm old school. it's released it's released there we go <laughs> to me if you dropped a record <laughs> We're gonna toss it. Company eight, it'd break you know well, if you're on a soccer team if you're dropped it means you're not playing next That's week very true. <laughs> we have to change the vocabulary in this <laughs> so it's good enough people <laughs> So the album is released on the 28th, and you have a show on the 29th at the Roxy, yeah. and with some amazing special guests and friends that are going to be joining you. What uh, what are you looking forward to on this show? And like, do you see yourself playing this entire album as a whole, or do you see yourself playing a mixture of things that you've been a part of throughout no, your career? I, I think I'll play a mixture of stuff. I don't want to ram people's stuff down people's throats, although some of it's good. But you, you know, mean some of it. Well, it's all pretty good, but it's you know if you hear something new for the first time or new to your ears, it's it's a bit of a barrage. And I also know if I'd gone to see David Bowie, which sadly we can't anymore, and he hadn't played Heroes, I would have gone home disappointed. So I know there's a couple of songs that people expect of me. Also, another thing as well is that I, I found out I had a band after the Sex Pistols called the Rich Kids, and uh, the Rich Kids album is just. And it never came out properly in America, and um, it's been re-released for Record Store Day. It's, it's just come out. And last night, a couple of people had copies of it there for me to sign. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of goodwill to that, so I'll probably do a couple of songs. That is funny. I, last week, I took a drive down to Malibu, and there's a there's a, a sort of a diner in the fancy Malibu bit called the Marmalade Cafe, and I walked in, and the maitre d' there maitre d but the head says hi glenn i said how do you know who i am he said i'm a big rich kids fan i said well i'm doing a show he said you're going to play any songs and i said yeah i might well do That's and he said i'm coming you know and, and in fact he'd been in a band i forget the name of his band but he actually opened up for the sex pistols back in 96 somewhere so wow. what a full circle moment yeah <laughs> well, and also on top of that after i saw him Oh, when I always try to go to Pal uh, Malibu because I like seeing the pelicans. <laughs> I like it. now I'm gonna see Malibu different. Like when I go see pelicans, I'm gonna be like, I, this is what he was talking about. Yeah, there's <laughs> loads of pelicans there, and they're fantastic. They sort of take off in formation and go and fish, but they don't all go at one time. They take turns. Yeah, I That's think it's so. It's, and then they come back to the lagoon there and sit down and scoff them. You've really been paying attention. I pay attention, yeah. <laughs> But there's other bird life there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, with this this incredible career that you've had, like, I feel like it had to start somewhere, right? Like, so um, I'm curious, like, I want to go back in time and, and, like, that first session with Chris Thomas as a producer. Right. Um, and I believe that was for Pretty Vacant. If no, that was for Anakin in the UK. Okay. okay. So that was the first thing that we recorded with him. He's just a class act, you know, he'd already always work with quite top niche yeah. people, Roxy Music stuff, this, that and the other. He even did 
He worked on the White Album, The Beatles, he t told me, and he's not credited because he was a young man, but he did a lot of stuff. That's another story another time. But he also <laughs> did um, Conquistador by Procol wow. Harum. With live with a symphony orchestra. I'm not supposed to like stuff, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> stuff like that, but I don't care anymore. So, those experiences like with him, like just because it's it's you know it's a first big experience, like first time in the studio, first time writing with or working with a producer. Well, we've done, like, done demos before, and the very first thing we went in the studio with was with another sort of compatriot of, mm. of um, Chris Thomas, is Chris Spedding, who was like an ace session guitarist then and he took us in the studio and it was funny we sat up and he said you know have a play and we'll get some sounds up and then after about 10 minutes we played through three or four songs he said come and have a listen we're going listen to what and he said well we've been recording he said you can't have recorded it you didn't have the red light on it and he said, well, we record it anyway, that's not fair. And he, he didn't turn the red light on because when you're in the studio for the first time, you think, oh, we're recording now. And that's when people make mistakes. So it was a bit of psychology. Yes. So we've done a few things like that. And then we was in with Chris Thomas, you know. That's a, that's a cool psychology. How do you feel like that kind of helped you in the studio moving forward? Like, at, you know, when you started to create more music, no matter what artist or what band you were part of? Um... Yeah, you just pick, it's like anything in life, you pick up a few little point, pointers and hints of how to go about things and sometimes you utilise them and sometimes you don't, you know. But I just always thought when you press record it made the red light go on. <laughs> it's obviously not the case. It's a good trick. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps they're trying to save the light bulb to make it last longer. <laughs> you know, times are tough and we can't pay the bill. Yeah. I'm super excited for this album to be released and... Um, how you know, I feel. I don't know. How do you feel? Like I'm excited. You know, <laughs> it could be the key to doing a lot more stuff. If it isn't, I'll just do another one anyway. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't mind if people don't like what I do. Mm. What is galling is when you put something out and you bump into somebody two years later and say you're doing the gig and play a song. They say, "Oh, that's a good song. Is that a new one?" You go, "No, it was on their album two years ago." Oh, we didn't know about it. You know, that, that's the disappointment sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, and that's why I, I talk to guys like you in lovely settings like this, but yeah. you're just trying to get the word out there, you know. Check it out, folks. Yes, check it out. It's out on the 29th, 28th, show at the Roxy's on the 29th. It's called Consequences Coming, and um, thanks so much. I hope there will be consequences coming. For I'm scared for that, but yes, I agree with you. Well, uh, in a way, you know, it's, the world seems to revolve around these days bet between the hoodwinked and the hoodwinkers. Yeah. And I'd like to see a few more consequences coming for the hoodwinkers. I think there's a very dim and distant light at the end of the tunnel that yeah. people are wising up to the people who would hoodwink you. But, you know, it's, everything's become so polarised. One idea is of one person's idea of being hoodwinked by somebody is kind of diametrically opposed to somebody else's but i know where i'm coming from yeah and that's all that matters yeah yeah so thank you uh for taking the time to to hang out with me you guys be sure to check out the album releasing next week and uh thanks for watching on front row live it's with this screen i can see it here. you look much bigger than me oh no and i'm just gonna prove oh, that no. i'm not a midget look see <laughs>